Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. Step into the This is Macabre Grimoire with Airy Show, Travis Nye, and Robert Maley. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Macabre Grimoire, Chapter 2, The Voynich Manuscript. So, I'm super excited, everyone. This is Robert, by the way, speaking. I am so pumped for this. This is uh, one of those classic, not conspiracy theory, but one of those classic paranormal investigative research things. The Voynich Manuscript has baffled people for hundreds of years. Let me give you just a little bit of background. The Voynich Manuscript is an illustrated codex handwritten in an unknown writing system. The vellum on which it is written has been carbon dated to the early 15th century, approximately 1404 to 1438, and it may have been composed in northern Italy during the Italian Renaissance. The manuscript is named for Wilfred Voynich, a Polish book dealer who purchased it in 1912. The manuscript has been studied by many professional and amateur cryptographers, including American and British codebreakers during the First and Second World Wars. No one has yet demonstrated or deci demonstrably deciphered the text, and it has become famous, a famous case in the history of cartography. Uh, the mystery of the meaning and the origin of the manuscript has excited the popular imagination, making the document the subject of novels and speculation. None of the many hypotheses posed over the last hundred years have yet to been, be independently verified. So that kind of gives you the boilerplate Wikipedia-esque you know, definition of what you're dealing with here. Um, what are you guys' impressions before I go on with another info dump about it? My first impression when you brought this up and i think i i think i said it kind of in our group chat yes and i laughed out loud when i read it. <laughs> so i found it okay um i think this book was written by someone who was trying to write a book in a different language but their grasp of that language was awful so like imagine if like a 16 17 year old kid was trying to write a book but in spanish and they only had like maybe one and a half years of, of like Spanish one and maybe a little half year like Spanish two. So like their grasp on the language is like minimal at best. Um, so this book is then created by this amateur and no one can understand it, but because it's been lost for so long, we now think this is a brilliant work of cryptography. And, but really it's just some teenagers failed Latin project. Um, and so that's kind of where I think <laughs> I kind of think that's what this could be. Right? Yeah, I I agree completely. When I when I cause I had never heard about this no, before yeah. we started talking about this. Episode. It's very much a like paranormal conspiracy theory nerd like uh, hot potato that, especially the internet has really made this thing explode. Right. But people have been investigating. We, we'll get to the history of oh, investigations yeah. of it. But people have been looking at it since it was rediscovered in the modern era in 1910. I like I said, code breakers from both world wars, uh, NASA scientists, all sorts of people have looked at this thing. Well, even like some people, I don't remember where they were from, but they, they developed an AI script to kind of decipher it. And the AI even said it was um, like like weird Hebrew-esque type that's, language. That's one of the most recent things that came yes. out in September of 2017. And yes. I have an update on that. Oh, because yeah, I was like, um, yeah, it's just kind of. It's weird, but yet I, I genuinely think, because if I look back on, like, all my notebooks from when I was, you know, in my teen years, if somebody were to find that, like, 500 years after the fact, I bet you anything that they'd be like, ooh, this is some weird code language. Well, I look back at some of my notes from six months ago, and I think the same thing. Right? Like, I don't know what this means. Right. Because, like, only you really know what these notes are, so, so yeah, let's... Yeah. Um... Let's go a little bit into what the content of this manuscript is that everyone's so geeking out about. Every page of the manuscript contains text, mostly in an unknown language, but some extraneous writing is in Latin script. This is usually like notes written in the margins, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, the bulk of the text of the 240-page codex is written in an unknown script, running left to right. Most of the characters are composed of one to two simple pen strokes, with some exceptions. Uh, some dispute whether there are distinct individual characteristics or if the script has around 20 to 25 characters 
Uh, but they, they think they've got it down like 25-ish characters mm-hmm. that are like expressed throughout the thing. Um, and there's no apparent punctuation system that they can see. The manuscript's diagrams, which is part of what makes it famous, is uh, th- and we've included a link in the show notes to a PDF of the Voynich manuscript. So if you want to, you know, see it firsthand, you can uh, totally check it out. The diagrams inside of it, which are kind of you know really intriguing, they are breakdowns of like biological plant life and diagrams of things uh, like that, biology and science. You'd almost say for the era, uh, mixed with a bunch of astronomy and astrology information. Mm. And, uh, like, you know, star movement observations, things like that. Uh, One series of 12 sketches actually depicts the conventional symbols for the zodiac constellations. Uh, There are chunks of the uh, tableau that are missing. uh, And so we don't have the... Basically, there was, like, a page for each one. And we don't have the Pisces or the Taurus uh, or the Sagittarius because those were lost. Mm -hmm. But we have the rest of them. And then each one of these has... uh, around 30 female figures arranged in uh, two or more concentric bands, and the females are usually partially to completely nude. Supports my teenage boy theory. Just This saying. is true. <laughs> just like, this is what girls do! <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that some of them appear to be labeled by a star, and the stars seem to be attached to the women by a tether or a cord of some kind. The last two pages of this section, uh, oh, as I, as I said earlier, were, were lost. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. And so there are you know, just lots of stars and diagrams, and naked women all over it, and really cool, funky plant uh, layouts and stuff like that. There's even been some theories uh, that, you know, they have a really hard time trying to identify the plants. Yes. But an author of that era, you know, they didn't look at the world and science the same way we do, or right. we always want, like, a literal physical truth. Yes. It's kind of a legacy of the scientific revolution. So even when people were writing about a plant that everybody knew really well and diagramming it out, mm-hmm. it could be very abstract, even if it was a common plant, right. because they didn't see the world as this literal thing that we do, where we're very Aristotelian and, like, looking at the physical. Right. Um, so that makes it a little confusing, but some people think that one of the plants that's diagrammed in it is a sunflower, which obviously comes from the New World, and so that would, you know, it's like, it'd be a plant that didn't exist in these people's, like, world at the time. Right, so right, what yeah. heck? So maybe it's just a plant that resembles a sunflower, or, you know, who the hell knows? It's just right. a big, big mystery. It's a random doodling. <laughs> yeah, you're just still going with the random yeah. doodling. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the first confirmed owner uh, that we have of it was uh, George Baresh in uh, 1585 from six, till 1662, uh, who was an obscure alchemist from Prague. Uh, he was just as puzzled with it as modern scientists and referred to it in his journal as a sphinx that had taken up space uselessly in his library for many <laughs> years, but he could not crack it. Uh, and then he gave it to a Jesuit scholar and uh, who was very skilled with the Coptic language and even claimed that he, which would be erroneous because no one has translated hieroglyphs until the Rosetta Stone in like the 1800s, Napoleon's expedition, but this Jesuit scholar at the time was claiming he could read hieroglyphs. And so he sent it to this guy hoping maybe he could make sense of it. Uh, Let's see. Sent it to that guy in Rome, and then we have a letter in 1639 mentioning the manuscript and its whereabouts. And then we have another, because it's just, you know, back then it's like our paper trail. There's a paper trail because of it's Europe and they're keeping records and stuff like that, but stuff gets lost over time. Oh, so yeah. we kind of, it's little, we go by connected dots between little mentions in some physical document we can find. So the next one is in August 19th of uh, 1665. A letter was written that was found on the inside cover of the manuscript, and it claims that uh, the book once belonged to. Uh, this Joannes Marcus, um, who was, my understanding from the reading, and I'm a little vague on this, is that basically he was like a court alchemist, like mentalist kind of mm-hmm. person, mm-hmm. who was trying to become the court astrologer to Emperor Rudolf II of the Holy Roman Empire. This would be around 1552 to 1612. And, uh, so he paid 600 ducats of gold for this book and it was part of his like whole like basically what you'd call nowadays a media blitz to try and like impress this emperor and become like a permanent fixture in the court Mm -hmm. um but we don't we don't have a confirmation that he ever got hired or that the emperor ever owned the book 
Then it drops off the radar until 1903, when, uh, let's see, there's a little Catholic society, the Society of Jesus, uh, was short of money and decided to sell some holdings discreetly for, to the Vatican Library. Uh, it kind of looks like this research in, went through the, the list of uh, books that were for sale and scooped up some of the books. Uh, and so in 1912, that's when uh, basically it almost kind of, you know, just throwing this out here as speculation, kind of looks like maybe this research or whatever uh, acquired or had the book fall off the truck when the Vatican was selling it to people. Yeah. And uh, so eventually he sells it for money to the Wilfred Voynich, who is right. how who we give the book the uh, name from. And so he acquired 30 different manuscripts, of which this was one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, and he spent seven years trying to build up scholarly interest in this book to try and get it translated because he's like, you know, he's an antique book dealer. He sees this shit all the time. Right. And he was just completely stumped as to what the heck this was. So then in 1961, uh, eventually uh, his heir would end up selling it to uh, a buyer and that buyer uh, basically tried to like sell it for, upsell it for more money. He couldn't do it, so finally in 1969 he donated it to the Rare Books collection at uh, Yale University, and that's where it is today. What I don't understand is why give the name the Voynich Manuscript, because that seems kind of, I don't know, self-serving. Like, I'm the guy that found it at the book sale, but really it's like, no, you he, didn't find it. It was owned by several other people. It's not clear that he would have given it that name. It was sure. that... It's the most famous manuscript that he owned and that he circulated. Sure. And that others, in documenting like their studies of it, the manuscript that Voynich passed around that we were all trying to translate. That yeah, that's so kind of where I was going with. He yeah. did. Now there's something to be said for that that he did go on like a media, not a media blitz at the time, but like a he did like a letter writing campaign and yes. stuff like that to try and get scholars to look into it. But I'm not sure that he actually like gave it that name. He may have called it you know, like the, the codex or the cipher or something sure, like that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but it's people that came after him who would have, like, codified it as that. And basically people use that name now because he's the, like, modern discoverer of gotcha. it. Gotcha, okay. Because it basically was, like, kind of lost and no one knew what they were dealing with until 1910. Right. He's the first one to be like, this is a mystery, let us look into it. Right, in right. In the modern era. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah, because that was, that was just the one thing I was just like, that just seems kind of bizarre that he would name it after himself. It's like, it's not yours, you yeah, know? Yeah, and it's... Like, why not call it the Italian Renaissance cipher, or, you know, the... Yeah. Something, something and, and, that And I've said. seen that before in other, like, antique books and stuff, where mm -hmm. they, they name it for, like, the book dealer when it's so old that it's, like, not clear oh, what was going on. Oh, I see. And then part of it, too, is... You know, we could say it was the Shakespeare manuscript or something like that. If we knew something about the author or the content, right, you could right. give it a name that was more appropriate. But mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, weird plant book doesn't really roll off the tongue, especially for someone <laughs> in 1910. Weird plant book. Hmm. No, you're right. <laughs> yeah, just not as catchy. So here's some theories about where it came from. The, the first one is that... Uh, uh, and I like this one a little bit. It's just because it's cool. I have no idea if it's probable. But uh, John Dee, who was a mathematician and astrologer to the court of Queen Elizabeth I of England, basically people think this might be his like spell alchemy astrology book. Oh, sure. And uh, there's actually a paper trail where it's like if Roger Bacon, who's one of the figures who's like associated with the book early in like when we're aware of it from mm -hmm. documents, if Roger Bacon had it, he met with John Dee and interacted with him a lot, and so there's a strong possibility that maybe he's the one that generated it. Um, and, you know, still doesn't tell us, like, how to translate it or what it's talking about or anything like that, mm -hmm. but would give us, like, an author. Um, so, now, one of the common ones up until 1999, and I think that's why it exploded on the internet, right. because that's when people were really like, okay, this is really a legit thing, it's not just an urban legend, uh, was that you know, up until that point, a lot of people suspected that Voynich himself fabricated the manuscript. As an antiques book dealer, he probably would have had the necessary knowledge and means. And uh, a lost book by Roger Bacon, the figure that I mentioned earlier, would be worth a fortune. Mm -hmm. However, modern forensics since then have been performed on the book, and they seem to make it less and less likely that it is, in fact, a forgery. The pages are actually composed of lambskin that can be very accurately carbon dated, to, and that's why they can give you like 1408 to 1438. Uh, 38. And, uh, you know, and then there's like 
there's techniques where people will use old parchment like that and then bleach it and then put, not bleach it, but sophisticated chemicals on it and then yes. put their own stuff on top of it. It's been tested for that and the, the chemicals in the, and it was definitely written with a quill pen. They used electron microscopes to confirm that. Uh, the, it's definitely, or it looks a lot like the ink, like the black and white ink is very much like from that era, from like the 1400s. Mm -hmm. uh, the coloring, like the green on the plants and stuff like that, was added after the fact. But apparently for like manuscripts in the 1400s, 1500s, that's pretty common that like a hundred years later, someone goes and is like, I'm going to style up this book. Right, here you go. <laughs> and that was one of my questions too, because I, like, I don't know what the whole writing utensils were in the 1400s, like if they had access to those colors and stuff, and that was one of my big questions. Like, yeah, they, they, they have colored it. And like, they, they could have colored it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had colors that because that's you know you're coming off the era of like illuminated manuscripts, those gorgeous books that, yeah. you know, and that's the other thing when we talk about like a, it was a teenager's journal or something yeah. like that. Books from this time, think of them more like terabyte hard drives or like state of the art data storage, where it's like a book is a super expensive like five hundred gold pieces. Uh, like worth like a whole like family's income for two years a piece of precious right right uh, data can, you know and that's you know so it's it's like people didn't do they did a lot of the margins there's we could do a whole thing about how the <laughs> funny all the funny graffiti that monks oh, who yeah. transcribed books over the years yep. have put in the margins for example uh, Vox does a great video about uh, why that it basically became a meme with monks in Northern Europe that uh, if you go through all these different manuscripts that they transcribed during this period, mm -hmm. they all have knights fighting s giant snails <laughs> like <laughs> as cartoons in the margin and then it's the snails winning and stuff. <laughs> and uh, it's just like, it was just like a meme from the time and these bored monks who are just like writing the same piece of Latin over and over and over again, get bored and start, you know, drawing something in the periphery of it. And that's pretty common. And there's all sorts of little graffiti things like that. In fact, even the Voynich manuscript, the little bits of Latin that we're talking about that are written in the margins, that's what that is, is that someone was studying the book in like 15 or 1600s mm. and was, you know, just jotted down a note like, get groceries, you know, <laughs> yeah. in the margin. <laughs> Uh, and those we can tell just from like the style and the ink and stuff like that that are from a different time and obviously different looking script and all that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it I I came away with this this part here being like how frustrating was that for Voynich that it was not to, I mean well after he's dead in oh, 1999 yeah. when people are finally like okay this is not a fake that that, that he's just like hawking around you know right. there's really something to this yes. Yes. But it took forensic science until, like, the new millennium, basically, to, uh, the willennium, if you will, to uh, <laughs> get to the point where they could confirm that for him. It has been suggested that some of the illustrations in the book are from an Italian engineer named, and I'm going to slaughter this, Giovanni Fontana. Good job. Um, slight, and they slightly resemble the Voynich illustrations, and they're actually, in the Wikipedia page, they have a picture of some of, uh, Giovanni's, uh, uh, sketches in his like notebooks and stuff, and notebooks like he's a teenager. Yeah, it he's is. got me doing I'm it. Sorry, <laughs> it's a good theory. Uh, it is a good theory. It, they, but uh, no, so they do kind of resemble the same art style, and the people he draws look kind of like the women from the fountain and stuff like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and he also um, was big on using ciphers in his book. And I'm, I got a whole thing I'm gonna launch into about the ciphers and why they did that in books from this era and stuff. Uh, basically, you get into like why it's proprietary information, and it's like this is their livelihood and their like secrets, and so and they don't even want like another alchemist to be able to read it because like if they've got this really great thing for like you know painkillers oh, or a sure. healing of some kind, mm -hmm. it's like that's their their livelihood, and they don't want some other you know yuckster picking up their formula and becoming the new alchemist to the emperor, right. Holy Roman Emperor, or mm -hmm. something like that. So you get a lot of ciphers and codes and stuff like that in codexes from this period. Uh, something I thought was interesting to talk about with this is the idea of, and the widespread implications I get from this of like, do you ever think about like future archeologists trying to understand like what we were doing now? Yes, I do. <laughs> Cause, Cause if you think, cause like that was my joke about the uh, Elon Musk launching mm -hmm. that roadster into space. I'm just like, that is just going to baffle the shit out of space archaeologists. Like, <laughs> 500 years from now, they're going to be like, what the fuck? Why? Why a vehicle? They, they, they didn't... 
they barely could get to space at this time. Who would put a car up here? Yeah. That's, that's insane. Oh, 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 sorry. It's going to be like a Viking burial ship. They're going to like think that Elon's musks are, or uh, ashes Elon's are in the trunk. Probably, yeah. Yeah, his musks yes. are inside of it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what's going to happen. Smell me, future people. Yeah. Like some, some poor sap was trying to drive out of the, out of the world. Yeah. It's like, flat earth is true. He drove off the edge. But, the, but at the time, that would have been so expensive. Well, who would have done that? Oh, an eccentric billionaire, of course. Yeah. But, uh, no, that, you know, they get, using a cipher during that time, like I said, is their way of, like, securing proprietary information, the same way we would encrypt a hard drive nowadays. And I think that's interesting, and it makes me, like, shudder to think and a little bit nervous about and I've heard people comment on this before that future archaeologists are going to have a devil of a time researching our time period mm -hmm. just because of all of the uh, DRM or digital rights management on oh, software sure. so we could have somebody sitting in a museum like 600 years from now trying to understand our era and the software that's designed to keep me from getting a free copy of Microsoft Word might keep them from being able to read important documents from this era. Right, right. Because everything is, like, locked up. You can't just, like, pull it off a bookshelf. Well, but don't they have that uh, that uh, technology storage in some uh, mountain in, like, in, like, some country, like Sweden or something? Like, like there's, like, a whole, like, uh, museum, basically, where people can't tour it, but this is where anything that's been created technologically is stored in this mountain. Should anything happen, like devastating happen to the, the current technology of today? So, like, anything that dates back to, like, the early 70s and the 80s and, you know, like, computers and terminals but and... Does that actually exist? It does actually Is exist. that fail-proof? Is that, you know, how, how secure is that? Because, I mean... One of the things I always think about is, like, are we living in a dark age because of all of our DRM? Because, you know, you understand oh, sure. the concept of a dark age is not so much that it was dark times and evil <laughs> things happened. When historians say dark age, it's because they're describing a period of time that is dark to them because they don't, they have so few records. Like, I took this, uh, the Dark Ages history course... Uh, well, I didn't take it, but I watched the, the video lectures. It's the Harvard one on iTunes University where you can watch, like, great, like, university lectures. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy was talking about, it's like Bede or some medieval historian or something like that. And basically he's just like, it was super devastating if, like, a historian during, you know, this is obviously later. This is more like Renaissance. But they live, you know, there was a time before that in the Dark Ages where Bede knew of, like, six other people that he could probably correspond with and could understand his writing, like the level of academic writing he was, you know, performing at. Can you imagine if there were, like, only six people in the world that, like, knew the special... Like, say you're an engineer or a doctor, and you're like, oh, God, if something happens to me, there's only, like, two or three people in the whole world who can, like, replicate my work or can explain what's going on. Right. And if, if something happens to those people, like, say, a plague, which, <laughs> like, happens always... Uh, you know, it's like you can lose huge amounts of like research and information and uh, histories and stuff like that. And sometimes I worry about that with us with the DRM. And then especially, I thought this is a good tie-in because we'll definitely do a future episode about this particular uh, disturbance. I always think about what if the Earth is hit with a giant magnetic storm from the sun? Because this is a thing that yes. happens. And in particular, I'm citing, uh, if you want to know what that looks like, Google the Carrington event, and if you're not familiar with that, that's where a giant solar electromagnetic storm hit the Earth. I want to say like the 18 what 1850s or something like oh, that. Oh yeah. And uh, what happened? It was about the time that telegraph lines were starting to become more popular and stuff like that. And what it did was those were like the only electronic devices around, mm -hmm. but it started fires all over the country and the walk, cause the wires, it was like so much current oh. coming through the atmosphere. It sparked fire and then like telegraph stations started on fire and yeah. the batteries that they used at their stations would blow up and stuff like that. They've said today that like, if that hit North America again, even just that same scale of storm as the Carrington event, which was not in solar terms right. that big of a storm. It was like it would be like an EMP hitting the entire like continental US and it would just fry like every electronic system just and you'd get we'd get eight minutes of warning it was coming. It's all. What's uh, EMP? Electromagnetic pulse. Okay, okay. 
I guess that's what I was thinking. So. <laughs> Most commonly associated with uh, atomic explosions generate them. Oh, I see. And so uh, a hypothetical weapon that's never been used that we know of is to gener is to detonate a atomic bomb in the upper atmosphere over an area where you don't want to blow people up with the bomb, right, right. but you create a storm in the ionosphere, same kind of thing mm. as the Carrington event, mm -hmm. and then everyone underneath it loses p all their electronics to get fried. Oh, damn. So it's like a preemptive strike where there's always like, there's lots of conspiracy theories and stuff about the U.S. will get hit with an EMP, and that's the first part of like a Chinese invasion or something yeah. like that. Electric... But no, like, so as you can see, we could do a whole episode about the Carrington event. Oh, yeah, and yeah, that, totally, totally. And the implications of that. So, yeah, good future episode. Sorry, <laughs> the no. side tangent. No, it, it was a good tangent. It's <laughs> one I brought up because imagine if the Earth got hit by something like that, that you'd just have this time period where historians would be like, oh, that's the Dark Age. We don't know anything about what happened between 1950 right. and, uh, you know, well, 2027. Facebook remind them on this day, some years ago. <laughs> <laughs> No, it would be totally wiped out because that was all stored on an electronic it's, server. It's, co it's cockroaches and Facebook. Yeah. Facebook for cockroaches. Whoa. Whoa. Started. Mind. Check the domain, see if it's available. Blown. <laughs> <laughs> so then there's another th a theory here with the Voynich Manuscript that it's a letter-based cipher. That's the one that a lot of people in the 1950s, especially this William Friedman from the National Security Agency, he was a main cryptographer in the 20th century working there, and uh, he started in the 1950s trying to use this in order to translate the Voynich Manuscript, which obviously he didn't get anywhere with it, but it's kind of amazing to think of, like, NSA code breakers and, you know... Yeah. People, World War One code breakers mm -hmm. and the ja the ones in who built like who translated the Enigma device yeah. and built the first computers and stuff like that. That they looked at the Voynich manuscript. That was their Kobayashi Maru. It was their like unsolvable problem. Oh. It was their no win scenario. Right. Because they'd practice on that. Because it's just like, oh, no one's gonna crack this bad boy. Why would they practice on something that's uncrackable? Like the challenge. That's a terrible thing to practice on. I, I guess... I think, uh, maybe, I think that's a terrible maybe thing Maybe they don't practice, on. practice as in, like, drill it so much as, like, between well, like codes. Theories and, some, and possibilities. Yeah, and think about, like, programmers sit around and talk about programming stuff and, oh, what's the hardest thing you've ever programmed or sure, something like sure. that. It's a challenge. It's a mountain for someone to climb right, or a challenge. Right. So it's just like... Like, oh, you get a cookie if you can crack this, mwah you're not going to. Yeah, maybe it's <laughs> maybe it's like the snipe hunt at the NSA. It's like, right. oh, translate this Voynich manuscript, <laughs> sucker. Yeah. <laughs> Check out the new guy. He's trying to translate Voynich. No shit? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then they just go along with it, like, oh, man, it's really tough, isn't it? Like, oh, oh, yeah. Then just make up stories like that somebody actually did crack it, so then they think... That they have to crack it, but really, you, you can't. Yeah, Bob got it in like an hour. I don't know. It, <laughs> it's clearly Latin characters. I mean, hint, hint, you're getting warmer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> ha ha, then walk off. <laughs> so, oh, shoot. In, so, getting into uh, a more recent one here. So, someone conducted a statistical anal analysis in 2013 using 10 bits per word and compared it to English or Latin texts. Mm -hmm. This Diego Amanico, who did the tests in 2013, says, it's very compatible with natural language and incompatible with random texts, which is something that's come up in the research, and there's even more tests where someone have used algorithms, like Google Learning kind of algorithms, to, uh, to say that this is not gibberish. There's like a clear right. structure throughout the entire right. thing that's like someone is communicating something through this. And then we've got the linguist Jacques Guy once suggested the Voyage Manuscript text could be some little-known natural language written in a plain or an invented alphabet. The word structure, I thought this theory was pretty interesting, is similar to many language families in East and Central Asia. So it might be, uh, so it might be something that's like a Sino-Tibetan or Chinese or Burmese language uh, that medieval scholars ran into like way before like Marco Polo and stuff like that. And so, you know, like in our modern times, we've invented, like, the, like there, you could do a whole history thing about the whole, like, the British when they invented the system that is, is universally used now for translating Chinese characters into Latin letters and back and forth. Uh, but this could be an example of someone trying to do that very thing, like, way before uh, that common system had been developed for figuring out how to translate a, an Eastern language like that. Right. And they said that it even has, like, the same structure and tonal patterns. 
So that I thought that theory was pretty interesting. How frustrating though to be like to just know just to know like God, this is a language. This doesn't mean something. But why the why the fuck can't I you know translate this? I mean, that's and, and it's of, like we were just saying yeah. it's like well, why do people spend their time on this and get right. so obsessed with it? It's like that's why because and something I thought was funny was one person in one of the books mentioned that is something about this particular one is that it looks easy. Yes. It looks very like this is something that if I figure out that this means A and this means B, I could translate it. Yeah. And so it sucks in a lot of cryptographers that way because they're mm -hmm. like, oh, because this has got to be easy. I mean, look at it. It's so straightforward. And right. then they just dig and dig. And the more they get, dig into it, the more they're lost. And they're, yeah, ka. We talk, oh, this is a different member of the National Security Agency, this James R. Child. He was a linguist of Indo-European languages, proposed that the manuscript is a hitherto unknown Northern Germanic dialect. He identified the manus manuscript as a skeletal syntax, several elements of which are reminiscent of German languages. Mm. I, I don't know on that one. I don't like, know You either. don't have a little, like, get much follow-up on it. And, I, like, obscure Germanic languages, I don't think of, like, late Renaissance manuscripts and think, you know... Northern German. Germany obscure dialect. Kind well, of thing. and but Germany was so different at the time in the 1400s right, versus the, how it was at the time. It's the Holy Roman Empire at the time. Right. It's like divided up into two billion little duchies and principalities that yeah, basically it, don't talk to each other. Because, like, based off, because, like, doing my own genealogical research, I found out that, you know, like, because Dominic always thought he was from. Germany, but then turns out it's like, no, you're from Romania, but now, based on how the lines and borders and stuff are drawn, like, yes, you are from Germany, how everything is now, but back at the time, it's, you were actually you would have Romanian. Been a Romanian. Yeah, so, kind of like, I'm Hungarian. So, it could be, but like I said, it, this thing is just a mystery that just gets deeper and deeper. That's why I think it's some, some kids, uh, <laughs> some kids, uh, attempt at, at writing a book, but they did a shitty job. Because, like, I tried to do, I tried to write my own, because I'm a huge Harry Potter fan, so I tried, and I ran a Harry Potter role-playing game website for several years. Oh, wow. And so, I tried writing... Nerd card punched. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. I tried writing my own um, History of Magic book, and, it, and I came up with a lot of drawings and symbols and charts and, you know, and, you know, language and stuff for the, for the book, and... And I'm, and like if anybody were to find that, you know, like hundreds of years down the road, they're down down the you know whatever in the future, they'd be like, "What the hell is this?" Will they understand the concept of fan fiction? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Will they know that? Will Will Harry Potter even be like a, something on their mind when they find it? Because they're probably going to be like, "Holy crap! Look look at this fantastical book and just all these charts and stuff. Like maybe magic was possible back in like two thousand two or whatever." I joke with my brother and actually with Amanda a bunch about how like I have this one t-shirt I wear that's the Hulk versus Wolverine and it's the oh. comic from the 60s of those two going at it mm -hmm. and I always call it my Hector versus Achilles shirt because yeah. I'm just like that's all they are is they're they're our version of, you know like Achilles who was dipped into you know the water of life by by a god and so he's indestructible oh. versus Hector the greatest champion of the Trojans and they're these larger than life immortal beings caught up in an immortal struggle and the same way that with comic books and movies it's like well then in this remake they kind of did this but in this comic book series they told this story it's a lot like how human oral traditions work mm -hmm. where it's not hard and set into a single like canon document about the history well i mean how many times has a superhero character died and then been born again so hundreds of years from now one historian could be like well there are some accounts that superman died fighting doomsday and others that <laughs> he came back after that and it's like historians still disagree on which is the you know the true ver or was the original version of the superman story from 150 years ago right you know? right well there's only ever there's only 12 stories that can ever be told and and that's it. Like, there's only 12 stories, and that's so, like, just sobering when you think of that. Like, all the content out there is just like, holy crap, there's only 12 different stories that can ever be told. So, as long as you have your heroine or, her or hero of the story that goes through, a, you know, some sort of monumental life change, then, you know, this is a completely, this is off topic. But, no. but I mean, but, you know, so then, yes, it's like, that's... So, like, the, the story of, like, the gods and stuff from, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, maybe that was actually just 
comic book crap that now we're regurgitating and re you know make but we know them as actual just fictional characters but right but later on maybe people will be like people actually believed in this stuff look at all their t-shirts and their yeah. mugs and, exactly. and their shrines exactly yes yes so and that's why i make that argument because you find references to hercules on all this different pottery and all these different cultures mm -hmm. and all these different legends that contradict each other about what his powers were and stuff <laughs> yes. like that. I used to be such a big fan of Jurassic Park that I still believe dinosaurs were real. I think dinosaurs were real. <laughs> <laughs> so here is my brief rundown of a history of people who've claimed to have translated the manuscript in the 21st century. Okay. Um, in 2014, we uh, have an expert of imply of... Yeah, implied. Of applied <laughs> linguistics, Professor Stephen Bax, who published an article in 2014 claiming that he had translated ten words from manuscript. I remember when this one came out, mm. uh, and he had used a similar technique to decipher some Egyptian hieroglyphics. He claimed the manuscript, manuscript is a treatise on nature in Near Eastern or Asian language, but no full translation was ever made before his death in 2017. Poor dude. So I'm kind of like... Does anybody have his notes or something, for God's yeah, sake? Yeah. Speaking of that, one guy dies and you totally <laughs> lose all knowledge. Yeah. Shit. Are those... Did he never publish those or release the ones that he says he did? Apparently. I, I didn't get... You know, obviously I didn't have, like, a lot of time to, like, dig right. into every theory, but it's an interesting one. But I'm always skeptical when someone's like, I have the answer, and then they drop off the face of the earth, because I'm like, so yeah, uh, he, yes. he died in 2017, but oh. he claims he found this in 2014, so why didn't he put out anything between now and... Well, it's conspiracy. He had to keep it quiet so people didn't kill him, which apparently that's exactly what happened. I, you got me there. I mean, yeah. He released it and died. Like Highly suspicious. Yeah. Yeah. But regardless, I mean, if... You know, any skeptics out there think that he even came close or has any contribution to it all, that would at least be a decent starting point. Yeah, I, and I agree. And it kind of even tied in with that theory we were talking about, about it being like an Eastern language or something, mm -hmm. you know, like a, like a uh, you know, translation for Eastern languages. Mm -hmm. So let's see. In September of 2017, a television writer named Nicholas, which always immediately makes me feel better about their research, yeah. uh, Nicholas Gibbs claimed to have decoded the manuscript as an idiosyncratically abbreviated Latin. Now, yeah, medieval scholars looked at his work uh, and they said that his hypothesis wasn't novel or original. They criticized it as patching together a whole bunch of already out there scholarship, perhaps even building upon the work mm. of, you know, Bax. And uh, basically, the Medieval Academy of America stated that Gibbs's decipherment doesn't result in Latin that makes any sense. I like that there is a Medieval Academy of America, and I kind of want to work there. So this last case here, this is the one that you're probably... You probably mentioned earlier that's uh, happened in just recently in like yes. November of 2017. Mm -hmm. So Professor Greg uh, Kondrak, and what's funny is I heard this one too. Yeah. And I actually had a friend before I started my research where I was like, well, I heard they translated it. And I was telling someone at work about this particular thing, but now we have an update that's like, yeah, not so Ooh, fast. Oh, so here's what's going on. Greg, Professor Greg Kondrak, a natural language processing expert from the University of Alberta, uh, together with his graduate student Bradley Hauer, used artificial intelligence, as, as a yes, as we mentioned, yes. to, to try in, in an attempt to decode the manuscript. Their findings were pre presented at the annual meeting of the Association of Computational Linguistics, wow, that's a mouthful, yeah. in 2017, in the form of an article suggesting that the language of the manuscript is most likely Hebrew, but encoding using encoded using algor or alphagrams, i.e. alphabetically. Is serial? <laughs> alphagrams? Yes, it is. Can't just get your alphagrams? <laughs> Cookies for breakfast? Uh, however, the team, and this is the part I didn't know about, but my coworker told me about, because I, I only, you know, they put out that news about, hey, they discovered a treasure ship, or, oh, they found this, or they cured this. Yeah, yeah. And then you, you follow up, like, six months later when the news doesn't isn't talking about it because there's no press release. It's like, oh, well, that fizzled, or, oh, they got bought out by this, or whatever. Uh, so here's the but for this one. However, the team admitted that the experts in medieval manuscripts who have reviewed their work are not convinced. 
uh, and the claim is uh, strongly disputed by an expert in Hebrew uh, and its history. Here's something I gotta say about that. Okay. So, okay, this, uh, okay, so, can you scroll up just a little? Yeah. Bit? Okay, perfect. So, okay, so they're saying that they might have kind of cracked this a little bit, but then there's other people saying, ah, bullshit. Do you think the people saying bullshit maybe are trying to protect themselves in a way because, like, they want to be the ones to crack it? Like, as in, like, a, like self-preserving because, like, like, out of an ego thing? Yeah, in academia, I've run into a lot of that. But by the same token, that's part of the built-in how academia functions is that you put out a hypothesis. Yep. Mm -hmm. And... Really, what, at the end of the day, what science is, is people try it. You put that out there, and then everyone tries to replicate it. Yep. And to punch the shit out of it to see if it can actually, like, stand up to being tested oh, and dissected sure. mm -hmm. and everything else. So, I mean, that's part... Of, there's an adversarial role in science and inquiry like that. Yeah. That's kind of built in mm -hmm. that you're going to hit. But I also know from personal experience with family members who've worked in, like, high-end labs and genetics and stuff like that, that absolutely people's egos play a big role in it as well. Yeah. So it's like, they complement each other. Like, is it, it's a chicken or the egg. It's like, do the personality types that go into this kind of thing drive that way? Mm -hmm. Or does this attract that kind of personality? Or does it make them more like this, you know? Right, right. So, yeah, there, there can actually, there can absolutely be a... Uh, a component to that but since they haven't put out their uh like a full translation or even like a big block of like translation it's really hard to dispute it between expert a says this and expert b says this mm -hmm. it seems like right now the consensus is that they haven't cracked it from what i've found but it's right. because it's so here's the thing it's so new as we record this in you know, February of 2018, and right. this was just in fall of 2017, mm -hmm. that, you know, this could shake out and we could learn a whole bunch more uh, coming up here, mm -hmm. but uh, we don't yet. It's like, that's macabre grimoire ripped from the headlines. Yeah. <laughs> if you've never heard it anywhere else, you heard it here first. Exactly. Uh, one thing I'm kind of excited about, one, is if that we ever find out what it is, I hope it's something that's just completely meaningless, like a cookbook. Like a dude just jumping. Yeah, it's notes, totally like, something mundane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like mm -hmm. dude's just like, yeah, I sold a cookbook for fifty grand. <laughs> yeah, like it, they translate it, and it literally the picture with the like naked ladies in the fountain. It literally all the text is in like in five different languages in Latin, in Hebrew, and all these naked ladies, naked ladies, naked ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Bar Simpson, like fourteen hundreds. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, El Barto. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, so. Final verdict on this. What, Travis? What do you think it it is? Uh, oh. Honestly, look into your look into your heart. What do you honestly <laughs> think it it is? If you if you had to get like gun to your head from a time traveler, what what do you guess it is? Based on the plants drawings, because I have no clue what it says. I'm just going on pictures here. Well, no one has a which clue is what like it says. ninety percent of my books at home are all pictures. This is true for me. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna say based off the plants and the naked women. It's the base foundation of all cocaine manufacturing plants. Um, plants is not in the plant itself, but in warehouses. Oh. Because the women are not allowed to wear clothes. Oh. So they cannot steal the product. Okay. Mm. And, you know, they're making all the product out of the plants. I think that's what it is. I think so it's, is. it's like the personal journal of the, f like, late Renaissance uh, Scarface. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> El Scarface. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. Oh, my gosh. Nice. I like this theory. Yeah. Nice. So, all right. Um, you, you kind of have already, like, given us your thesis on I do. I, 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 did, I just need to know if, if you're solid with it. And if it is, I need, like, a background about this boy who wrote this book. Why do you need the background? All you all you gotta know is just that some some you know prepubescent some prepubescent teenager. Give us some more character okay, development. Okay, okay, okay. So like, does he you have, have this, friends? Is this is something? He has free? friends. Well, he kind of, but it's one. So he doesn't have a lot of friends. He has one best friend. So okay, he figure his his parents. His mom obviously doesn't do anything because she's not allowed to work because you know fourteen hundreds in Italy. And then you have his dad who's actually a bookmaker. So these pages that he's obtaining, which would be very expensive, um, he just steals them from his dad's. And that's why it's not it's it's a huge volume, but it's collected pages over time within that you know that era that's able to carbon date back to that time period. And he him and his friend are just 
fucking around and just saying, let's, let's practice, you know, drawing these plants. Let's practice drawing these things. And, oh, let's make some boobs, you know. And it's just like a weird, like this weird made up dumb language that ends up becoming just like this story of him and his friend just hanging out. Now, I don't truly think that that's the case but it's an idea of d it's just some kid fucking I'm, around I'm trying sure it's to not one that's been explored well that's probably has <laughs> it most definitely hasn't been explored but you know that's just kind of a, a thought that that was like the first thought that came to my head is that this is just somebody who was um trying to make up their own you know trying to practice writing in another language and didn't know what they were doing and had, had no way to like check their work with somebody who actually knew the language and just so you're saying it's history's equivalent of a man who is clearly two children on top of each other in a trench coat Yes, yes, exactly. yes. So I think the true, for those of you who are listening who want to actually decipher this thing, I think the true way to do it is not find the kid who wrote it, but find his best friend, because he's going to be the careless one that leaves the code laying around. Probably. Well, there is no code. It was a, they, they did a blood oath. Oh. They, had, they were blood brothers, and they shook on it. Right. Okay, you took that <laughs> comment about character development to heart. <laughs> I did. <laughs> We're we're getting a rich backstory about this, yeah. About a com it's a coming of age story about a young, young, young man in Italy, in northern Italy, trying to find himself and his best friend on their adventures, and yeah. with their with their father, the bookbinder, and their... yeah. Now I'm gonna have to say he probably had like a sheep farm, if the pages were made out of sheepskin, lambskin. Yeah. No. Well, not necessarily because they buy it from. Yeah. You know. It's but they'd have to have access to a supply of sheep. Yeah, That's what I'm saying. I would say so access to So there's a part two, find two kids that live close together with a sheep farm somewhere close, and there's your... From like, what, 500 years ago or 400 years ago? I was going to say, we're pretty much describing, describing northern Italy in the 1500s. It's yes. like, you know, it's like cut to someone standing around in medieval Italy, northern Italy, being like, there's sheep shit everywhere! <laughs> yeah. Back to Travis. <laughs> okay, Travis, now you find it. Go on. <laughs> Figure Have it out. Have you seen this book? I'll be yeah. like, uh, Terminator guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to, like, form in a ball of light and just be like, have, have like, crappy printout PDF of it and be like, have you seen this? <laughs> like, fountains will not make it with me. Well, actually, they'd be like, Kvay? But it'd be like, <laughs> yeah. it'd be like a suspenseful scene where like the viewers never actually got to see the picture of the book that he's holding. Oh, sure, and sure. And because it's like so outdated, like it, it, at the end when you finally see it, it looks like a scene from Minecraft. It's just like super pixelated. Yeah. Um, what about you, Rob? What's your... Oh, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm intrigued by the Reese. I don't know. Your I most start... fantastical dream, ideally, like if, if it was to come out, like what would you... What would most excite you about it? Basically, the coolest would be that it is the actual spell book of Queen Elizabeth the First's mm. astrologer. That's the that's my favorite one as far as like yeah. that would just be so fucking badass. Uh, I'm starting to think, like when I like when I finished this research this morning at three a.m., I thought that. I would go with the this most recent interpretation with the the Hebrew one, mm -hmm. where it was like a, a form of Hebrew because that theory just like sounds good to me. And yeah. it's like, you know, you had a lot of like you look at the history of Jews in Europe in medieval times and stuff like that. They would have had a lot of reason to like have proprietary knowledge that they're protecting with a cipher mm -hmm. and would have been into like medicines that like border on magic and stuff because that was kind of like arms distant from like stuff that you know Christians at the time would dabble in. Right. Um, and it, it would explain a, a lot that was going on there. So it just seems plausible. But more and more, as we've gone through this research and we've talked it out with each other, I'm leaning towards the, it's Eastern, it's from East, like East Asia. Mm -hmm. And it's stuff that was brought over before anyone had any idea how to handle it or how to translate right. what, what, what they were looking at and what they were dealing with. Right. So... Cool. So how did you first, like, find out about the Voynich Manuscripts? Because I've never heard of this. Um, let's see. I watch a lot of YouTube videos. Okay. And it, it comes up a lot in, um, like, top five greatest mysteries of history. Oh, really? Because I like historical yeah, mysteries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is always, like, one of the top ones because okay. it's, it's pretty uncrackable. It, and the, 
and it's a very like implies knowledge or technology that is way ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. Well, Vo Voyage doesn't really apply that because we don't know enough about what it's actually studying. Right. But it gets lumped together a lot with something that we will do an episode about called the Antikythera Mechanism, which is an ancient Greek mechanical computer that could calculate the movements of the planets oh, that was found in a shipwreck. Yeah. Uh, it is the coolest, most mysterious, like, historical object. It, it, it's like these three. The Voynich Manuscript, the Antikythera Mechanism, and the Babylon Battery. Where, like, a guy, a guy in Babylon actually built giant working batteries oh, wow. back in, like, 1000 BC or, or earlier. Yeah. And we have no idea what he was using them for, but he had, like, the citric acid and he had special... Uh, pottery made to hold the citric acid and then he had the like copper and the iron or however that works with a battery yeah. and copper wires and stuff running off of oh, it dang. and he was using electric current for something and some people think he was like a performing sorcerer or something like that or that he thought it had medicinal purposes and like basically like people would think he had magic or, or, just, or trying to create gold because alchemy was like a huge thing yeah, yeah. well we just because it's so far back that we literally don't have like a lot of written records yeah, from right, that time. Right. It's like, what the hell is this? So that's the big three in like his historical mysteries is probably historical amongst lay people on the internet is uh, Annie Kithra mechanism, the Voynich manuscript, the Babylon battery. I gotcha. Okay, I think I need to d dive deeper on YouTube then. Yeah, it's it's cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's that's the Voynich Manuscript in a nutshell. Uh, <laughs> I hope I didn't, like, bore everyone to death with that, like, history of a book thing, What's, but I think we had fun along the way. Yeah, well, what are some, like, uh, examples of maybe, um, like, modern... Is, is, has there been documentaries or there's movies? Because it says that there's, like, it's inspired, like, movies and books. So, like, what are some movies and books that are kind of been inspired they by it? They had a list of it on Wikipedia, but I didn't recognize any of the books. But they're, like, there's a lot of novels out there that, like, mention it. And sure. And you see a lot of, like, Da Vinci. It's very Da Vinci code. Gotcha. It's very, uh, um, you know, that kind of style of storytelling, like, national treasure inspired. Sure. Or, like... Knights Templar conspiracy kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They'll use like an un untranslatable codex from medieval times, secret knowledge kind of thing. Yep. Uh, so it you know it, it almost like is kind of like one of the progenitors of the trope of the you know medieval right. lost knowledge conspiracy hidden knowledge thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that. See, so, yeah, I was trying to think like, oh, what are some things that we could watch to to like I don't know get into that world but, but YouTube I mean, has, a, has many like and there's like little short ones that are like top five mysterious things oh I and see then they, and then they have ones that are like the story of the Voyage Manuscript where it's like a two hour long old history channel documentary gotcha about okay well, that's kind of cool I love YouTube for because that's where the real history channel is now because mm. now they do like I don't know, fucking Axemen or, like, grizzly guys who ride grizzlies on ice roads or something yeah, is, what, is what the History Channel does now, whereas they used to tell history, damn it. Yeah, they used to. I used, we used to watch ice road truckers during the summer because it helped us feel not so hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, thank you for tuning in, everyone. Uh, once again, you can follow us on Facebook. Uh, be sure to check us out at macabregrimoire.com. Uh, and be sure to, you know, hop onto our Patreon, where I'm sure we're going to be offering some exclusive content. Um, and thank you once again for joining us, and we'll catch you next time with another fantastic mystery. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like mystery. I'm sorry. Macabre Grimoire is a production of the SiouxEmpire.com. Learn more at macabregrimoire.com.